Welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Dr. Anna Wasesha, President of Middlesex Community College, and today's show is our annual meeting with the brilliant and talented duo who bring Art Farm to life every summer on our campus with a Shakespearean production. So yay, this summer, it's <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream. It is. Yeah, so, um, and last year, you didn't really reveal what it was going to be for a while, so there was some suspense. Right. So how did you land on Midsummer Night's Dream? Oh, that's an excellent question. Dick, why don't I well, let you speak to that? Okay, well, I think one of the reasons that we, we chose Midsummer Night's Dream this year is that it's our 10th season of producing Shakespeare here at the college. And our first show was A Midsummer Night's Dream in 2006. And I think we just felt like it made sense to bring it back because it was, it's just, it's such a perfect play for an outdoor location. And it's, you know, we were, we had done King Lear last year, which was very dark and heavy and everybody dies. (laughs) (laughs) The very definition of a tragedy. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, and and though it was very popular, we didn't know, you know, going into it is like, is anybody going to come to see King Lear and it was our most popular show we've ever done here but we thought you know let's do a comedy let's do our favorite comedy and let's celebrate the 10 years by kind of you know not recreating but going back to the first production that we did here do you remember that production I do remember that production (laughs) does anything stand out very different what was what was the highlight of that production I think that the highlight of that production was how much we did with so little (laughs) because <laughs> uh, <laughs> we really had no budget we were at you know or very little budget we were asking everybody we knew for favors bootstrapping it bootstrapping <laughs> it that's right we we had a terrific set designer who is uh a floral designer and and just worked a lot with the natural elements and uh i was i think you know we and we had no no sound reinforcement, so everybody had to be speaking really loud. Uh, we had no lighting, so the end of the play was was Isn't lit the by fire. Lit by fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, we just couldn't afford anything. <laughs> and uh, we did a you know a, a core of really strong actors, and it was very athletic and magical. And I think uh, you know we surprised ourselves and the community with just what magic was created in the Grove that year. And, you know, after that, we started to build up the budget and... And audience. And audience. And, you know, we put microphones on people so they could actually hear what we were saying and uh, got lighting and, you know, it just started to professionalize because, I mean, one of the things that became clear after a few years is that you can't just keep going and asking people for favors year after year and, and have it be professional. (laughs) <laughs> that ultimately, if you want professional, you've got to pay people. The difference between an amateur and a professional, right, is a paycheck. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yes. And, uh, Were you acting or directing at that point? Um, I directed. Marcella was acting. She was playing Hermia, one of the young lovers, uh, in that production. And she could still play one of the young lovers now, but uh, she's playing Titania, the fairy queen, this year. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, I, I will say, too, just back to the original question about why Midsummer, one added piece, and, and you started to speak to this, Dick, is, is the accessibility of this particular show. It is exciting, it's vibrant, it's got lover's confusion, it has wacky clowns, it has uh, sort of an aristocratic element, so it has this sort of really understandable storyline even though there's confusion in it but it also has magic which I find you know the fairy world and this mischievous character Puck there's something about them that I find audiences just sort of are ready to sort of relax and relate to and laugh with and explore and I feel like You know, Shakespeare aficionados can still really enjoy Midsummer, And if this is your first time, or if you have a child, or you are a child, it's something that is graspable. And I feel like even theater educators often use in the classroom because of that, because it's it's just you want to sink your teeth into it and say yes. 
And so, yes, now we have to take a break. I'm going to sink my teeth into that pause, and we will be right back after this message. Well, we're back, and this is Middlesex Moments Radio Show, Mm -hmm. and it's the summer of Shakespeare and the 10th anniversary of Shakespeare in the Grove. Tiny little factoid. I'm on the board of the Rockfall Foundation, and I Mm -hmm. said, how long have you been giving grants? And they've been giving grants for a long time. So I said, you know, could I see a list? And in 1989 and 1990, they funded the, the planting of those trees. Oh, which wow. is really remarkable, oh, so that there could be an outdoor interesting amphitheater Isn't space on this campus. We've often wondered yeah. how, who made that so, decision and how that happened. Right, so did I. So oh. it, it's, it came from the Rockfall Group, oh. which is nice. So a tribute to them, and in a really wonderful place. It is just the best place. And so you were, you were saying accessibility, Yes. and the play itself is accessible. Right. One of the things I, I would just say is that anybody who wants to come one night could come a second or a third or a fourth night because it gets more accessible the more you you get drawn into it. Right. And the more you hear the language. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. And you kind of you, you, you kind of know the story a little bit. There's a schema in your right. head. You right. kind of know what's going to happen. And then you hear things you didn't hear at the beginning when Absolutely. you first came to it. <laughs> so this year you're expanding. Yeah. You're, yeah. So you're expanding in terms of nights on the, on the, right. in the Grove. Yeah. Extended the run to 10 shows from mm. 8 so we've added Wednesday night performances, so Which it runs is Wednesday through Sunday. July 15th. 15th mm-hmm. to the 19th, and the 22nd to the 26th. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's exciting, and we're, you know, we're hoping that uh, we'll get big, big crowds and lots of families. I just feel like this is a great play to introduce your kids to Shakespeare, and a great play for... For anybody who thinks that they don't like or they don't understand Shakespeare, <laughs> this will be the one that will shake them out of that and go, hold on, this isn't what I thought. <laughs> this is really fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and again, I, I, I'll go back to why, you know, we talked a little bit about why Midsummer, but then I also think that part of part of Art Farms, uh, Art Farms and Shakespeare in the Grove success, I believe, is the strong sort of stamp of physicality that we have within the company that it's really important to us that the actors are very grounded physically and yet also able to make really strong physical choices because I think it's when that language is embodied that it becomes understandable when it's just read or you're just heard you know it can be interesting for some of us but for a lot of us it's just very dense and and obtuse and hard to grab onto but again i think you know the physicality of our company really you know shifts that paradigm and then this year um our production is circus infused so it has added elements of physicality which are a lot of fun so if you were going to draw a word picture of circus Mm. uh, what would you know circus infused Mm. what would that be well some of it is a surprise Mm. so there may be some reveal of of things um, that I think people will really enjoy that I won't tell you'll have to come and see Mm -hmm. but I will say that it's very acrobatic very clumsy in intentional ways in terms of some of the clowns there is a sort of classic clown through line that is wacky and just sort of butt gusting Uh, butt gusting (laughs) gut busting (laughs) I think that's something else. It <laughs> might... works both ways. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> uh, so um, also the, with the, with the um, addition of two extra nights, moving from eight nights to ten nights, that also means we are expanding our headliner acts, which are the musical acts that open before the Shakespeare. So every night at six o'clock, there's a different musical headliner, and then Shakespeare is at seven. And I could even say what they are. So we have Nzinga's Daughters on our opening night, which is Underground Railroad, African spiritual music. They're fabulous. They're really wonderful. Phil Rosenthal, uh, Ronnie Arbo, Crits of Moon, uh, Andrew Biagrelli, uh, Stacey Phillips and Paul Howard, Banning Air, Mix of Sean Rosie. Middletown's own Noah Behrman and Kate Callahan. So it's really on their own, they're worth coming to see exactly. a concert, which is kind of why we call them headliners, even though they're opening acts, they're really headliners in their own right. And it's sort of a, it's just a delightful way to come to the Grove. You come up to the campus, there's facilities, there's parking, it's handicap accessible, and you can come out. Find a spot. If you like the shade, 
There's some beautiful trees in the audience space. If not, you can sit in the sunshine, blankets or chairs, um, you know, bring your picnic and then listen to music in a relaxed way where you can still converse a little bit and, and nibble. And then the Shakespeare starts at seven. And, and you know, the one thing that we found that sometimes upstages us um, are the sunsets because I it's know. just so beautiful. I know. <laughs> the sunsets and the geese. The geese. Right. <laughs> when the geese fly overhead. <laughs> It, 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 it's, it's, it, I mean, it's already magical. I don't right. know whatever magical times, you know, to the 27th power or something. It is just so incredible. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a very relaxed atmosphere, too, mm. in a way, because, um, because you don't go into a theater with, you know, red velvet curtains that are right. parting. And you feel, well, you connected to the actors. The actors sometimes walk through the audience. Mm. And it's, it's a terrific experience. And I hope people will come out often, mm-hmm. not just once. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody should come once. Right. They would feel guilty if they didn't get out. Mm-hmm. And they have 10 <laughs> opportunities. Mm-hmm. But I think I'm promoting this year, I'm promoting multiple. I love multiple that. Multiple things. Yeah. What, what's the, the run? Have you gotten to a point where I know that, you know, this it opens six days from now. Right. The run time. Have you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be about two hours, including a 10 minute intermission, which is really short. Yeah. Yes. You know? So are you the dramaturg? Are you or who, who decides the cutting? Yeah, yeah, the, yes. the, the director, and that's me in this case generally does does the cut. And what is uh, that process like? Mm. Um, it, it is, um, you know, it, it's challenging <laughs> because, because there's so much beautiful language. But at the same time, for me, I mean, I, I don't want it to be three hours long. I don't think that works for a contemporary audience. And I don't want a lot of things where people are just not going to understand it. You know, so sometimes, especially with the comedies, you'll find there's a lot of the humor were probably really funny jokes in 1596 and local references and political humor that is just, you know, you could be speaking in ancient Greek and it would mean as much to a contemporary audience. So for me, I mean, my first thing that when I'm cutting is I, I cut for just comprehension. It's like if, if, if I read it three times and I still don't know what they're saying, it probably doesn't need to be there. <laughs> and then then I, you know, look at the story, you know, is this, is this help? Do I need this to tell the story or could we do without it? And... Um, uh, and then, you know, sometimes there's there's just beautiful language that you want to keep in because it's beautiful language. Or language that people will know. That's I mean, right. So much of Shakespeare has made its way into just vernacular English. Absolutely. That's right. And it's, you know, it's hard. You know, it's like any editing. It's it's a little bit of, you know, killing your offspring in a way. It's like, you know, it's a tough thing to do. It's always five acts, right? So, mm-hmm. um so do you cut 10%, 20%? I would say with this script is probably probably close to 20% is cut. And it's like really that. woven through. I think it's interesting because hearing uh, Dick talk, these things are all true, and yet we're purists at the same time. We're not changing language. We're really attentive to metrical structure. There are elements within, a, within cutting the script that, again, comprehension and storytelling are paramount but the plays are written beautifully and you have to be sensitive to uh, build in a scene or a monologue for a character to make sure that the rhythm is still there and in a particular line like I said with the metrical structure if you change if you cut something sometimes you have to take a line from above and match it with a line below so that it's still rhythmically an audience member with a trained ear might pick up on things like that. But even an untrained ear, you may not know why something feels off, but sometimes it just doesn't feel right or it can be a little clunky. And, and so we're really attentive to um, to the edit so that it, mm-hmm. uh, so and it I, flows. And I think realizing too, and this is something you learn with more cutting, is that you know Shakespeare was a theater person. He, he wasn't just a writer. He was an actor. He was part of the company. He was a craftsman. He there's reasons sometimes where he has a scene might feel like, why is that scene there? It doesn't really add to anything, and then you cut it out and you realize, oh, it's because there's that really quick costume change or set change that has to happen. 
and this gives a space for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And, oh, we need to put that back in, actually, because we haven't been able to figure out how to make that change. But he thought about it. (laughs) I learned that from you last year. You know, just as an English literature student, you you never think about that, but Mm -hmm. you're actually creating this live. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Mm -hmm. so those sort of functions uh, would be uh, invisible to the ordinary reader. Mm -hmm. We have to take another break, and we'll be right back. We are back, and it's Middlesex Moments Radio Show, and Marcella Trowbridge and Dick Wheeler. I don't know if I said your names earlier. Mm-hmm. I should have, we've, we've gone through yeah. half of a show, and I haven't even said the names of my guests. The large farm people are here. Yeah, they are, <laughs> exactly, the brilliant team, the geniuses. Um, and, and we were just talking over the break about a little bit about a radio reality. We are actually sitting in my office at Middlesex Community College, and there are people on the campus, which is a, you know, reason to feel joyful, yeah. but occasionally noise will come in. So if, mm-hmm. it, if there's something extraneous or odd that uh, is being aired along with this broadcast with you all, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the noise and life of a college Which in the is background. Exciting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now let's. We just got a, you know the last part of this radio show, which always goes by like the blink of an eye. So now let's move to the death of Shakespeare, which is April of. 20, not 2016, 400 years ago. Right. Um, mm-hmm. right. 1616. 1616. 1616. Wow. 1616, yeah. So it's kind of a big deal around the entire globe. It is. You know, there's um, from Royal Shakespeare Company to the Shakespeare Theaters Association to the, to the Shakespeare Trust in Stratford are making a big deal out of the quarter centenary. <laughs> As like, are we. Word. Yeah, <laughs> great word. Yeah. My word of the year, <laughs> which will be on April 23rd of 2016, is the 400th anniversary of the death of Shakespeare. And um, so people are celebrating, I think, this is the fact that this work still means so much 400 years later and can feel so contemporary and speak to things that we feel and experiences that we have and move us and make us think and make us think about our lives and about each other even though these were you know characters written 400 years ago and and we're doing something this year in kind of a statewide initiative to sort of try and raise awareness about Shakespeare to to make people think Shakespeare talk Shakespeare recognize the role that Shakespeare's played in their lives and we're we're creating something called the Shakespeare 400 Passport, which um, has basically got about 20 or 25 events that are happening between July of 2015 and May of 2016 um, that are Shakespeare oriented. Most of them are plays, you know, at places like Art Farm or Elm Shakespeare down in New Haven at Yale Repertory Theater at Hartford Stage, Connecticut Repertory Theater. Um, some are special events like um, the special collections at Wesleyan's Olin Library is going to be doing a, a, a one-day special kind of open house of some of their rare Shakespeare documents and books that they have. That's going to be in April. And, um, and we're doing some events here on campus as well and working also with the English department in in embedding Shakespeare in some of the literature classes. And, uh, and we're actually even doing a little contest, I think, here on campus about um, all right, an, talking... An about essay contest, the, an essay the contest. Shakespeare 400 essay contest, which is basically the English department is sponsoring it, and Art Farm will be offering a $250 scholarship to the winner with the idea that it is a 400-word essay on, <laughs> on, w- on why Shakespeare matters. Hmm. And, uh, and that's, um, we've been working with uh, Terry McNulty in the English department on putting that together. And uh, in the spring, we're going to have some kind of a birthday, death day bash Wake, Wake. <laughs> here uh, on campus. Then I think be tied in, and we're still kind of working the details of all that. Of because um, our kind of main partners on this whole Shakespeare Four Hundred initiative are Middlesex Community College and Russell Library as well, and doing a series of events there. Um, and so I'm I'm hoping that I I would see that on the actual day um, that there I'm almost like you know a a pub, uh, pub crawl in the sense of like an event here, an event at the library, and then maybe culminating in something downtown, like in one of the restaurants or bars that was more of a, a kind of a late night Shakespeare, you know, 
Shakespeare, uh, Bard at the Bar. Bard at the Bar. <laughs> <laughs> this is Something sounding like that. really good. Fun. But, but the thing with the passport is basically, you know, people will be giving them out at, um, at Midsummer Night's Dream, but they'll also be available on, through websites and at the library and hopefully here on campus as well and uh, at the Middletown Arts Commission. Now, people can have these for the year and uh, go to different events. So you can go to see, you know, Romeo and Juliet at Hartford Stage Company. And when you get there, you can get your passport stamped. And anybody who gets up to uh, at, least ten, ten. at least 10 stamps becomes then entered into a raffle for all kinds of prizes that we're we're still kind of assembling what the prizes are, particularly what the grand prize will be. But, but really, uh, we're trying to encourage people to certainly come to art farm events, but not just art farm events, anything that is Shakespeare related that we've been able to find out about that's happening around the state of Connecticut is what we're trying to get people to get out, to see, to experience, to be a part of, um, because that's exciting. And I also think it's really, I'm excited that we're working with other organizations um, who are also enthusiastic to say, let's let's share, let's collaborate, let's get everybody out, um, you know, because we're a stronger community for it, I think. It is, it is amazing that 400 years after this man died, <laughs> the two of you are working so hard to keep his language and his creativity alive. You think about it, you know? <laughs> I'm not sure whether he should thank us or we should thank him. Yeah. I think <laughs> yeah. we definitely need to thank him. <laughs> Do you have a little story about how it was that you just that Shakespeare became so meaningful to you? I was 16 years old and I was in a performing arts high school and I had a Shakespeare teacher. Um, one of my classes, I had a speech and language class, um, was probably the first class I took with him and then I took a Shakespeare class with a gentleman named Paul Wagar um, mm -hmm. a few years back and I was cast, my first Shakespeare production was a comedy of errors and I was cast as what is normally the Duke, but in this case was the Duchess. And something happened for me. And I think part of it, I, I remember my teacher and director, I think we, I surprised myself and surprised him, but something happened that I felt a strength and a presence and it all made sense to me. And I was so excited by it. I, and at that point, you know, as a 16 year old, sometimes it's hard to get excited by things. Um, and, and if you can get excited by something, you should run with it. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I, I just fell in love with the details. Um, and I think that, uh, that the, the details of metrical structure, the details of really needing to work to get your mouth around the language and yet be having to have breath control and being in your body and somehow all of that made perfect sense to me and it was that director uh, teacher that encouraged me to audition as a theater major at university and um, and then I, yeah, I continued following Shakespeare around the country, as it were. <laughs> it it, it yeah. really does kind of take something like that, I think, you know, some, some moment where you're touched by it. Absolutely. Deeply. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And I do think that that's kind of why the English department here has responded really positively to the idea of bringing performing artists into literature classes to help understand Shakespeare as a performer rather than just reading Shakespeare for literature. And um, I think, you know, that is something unique that we can offer that is different than the training that most of the English professors have. And that's sort of you know, taking their words on that. And uh, um, that, you know, for, for so many young people reading Shakespeare, whether in high school or in college, they just get so mired down trying to wade through the language but then suddenly when you get up on your feet and start talking and start like looking at what this character wants and what they're saying to get what they want and how that all fits together and that suddenly it comes alive and and when you begin to understand how the metrical structure feeds the the objectives of the characters um, that you know other lights suddenly go off in in kids heads and uh, so I think you know the hope is that certain people who might not be able to just sit and read Shakespeare, if they can get up on their feet and speak Shakespeare and learn some of the 
some of the tricks and tools that you use to understand the text better, then they're more likely to go back and read it again. Right. Right. Because right. it's it's getting getting dusting it off and getting past the fear of of it being boring, maybe even. Um, mm -hmm. and getting getting it off the page and out of the mouth. There's like nothing very, boring about it. I don't <laughs> think so either. It's just so. so great. So so sadly, this whole program is coming to a, a swift end. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to remind everybody that starting July 15th at mm -hmm. 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. really the dinner hour, so it's a great time to bring some food out mm -hmm. and sit on a blanket, or I like a chair. Mm -hmm. I've, now we've reached my, for both. Yes. Um, <laughs> Have some dinner, mm. listen to some great music, hang out, mm. watch the play, experience the sunset, mm. and maybe if you're lucky, the geese. Mm. And mm. and then and then this and then it gets slightly twilighty, and then it gets dark, mm -hmm. and it's over, and there's this quiet movement mm. out to it. It's just so wonderful. So everyone, come to see a Midsummer Night's Dream, mm. and thank you both so much uh, for doing this because it, you know. Mm. It's so incredibly invaluable, and I'm so happy that Can you're here. Can we get the website in? Yes. <laughs> oh. It's art-farm.org. So if you want more details about time, price, information, go to art-farm.org, and, and you'll find it all there. You can buy tickets online. We just love our relationship with the college here. We feel, again, still it's beyond a win-win we're just thrilled um and thank you so much for all of your support oh it, yeah it's limitless <laughs> so thank you both for being here today and thank you all out there in the listening audience for spending some time with us on middlesex moments and be sure you get your fix of shakespeare this summer here mm -hmm. in middlesex with art farm uh this is anna wasesha wishing you all a very good day <laughs>